Look up the word crazy in the dictionary and you might just find an asterisk beside the definition that says, listen to the Subiquitous podcast featuring Sue Duffield and you'll find out what crazy means. Sue's travelogue journey of unfiltered stories, impossible miracles, and faith-filled fun will be revisited right here. So buckle up and let's get going with this humorous travelogue of an unfiltered saint, Subiquitous. The good thing about podcasting is that you can do anything at any time around the world. You can get on a, a microphone and you can talk and you can actually have Jeff Duffield in the same room with you doing brand new technologies. That's a scary thought. And I, I know. And it's it's really weird. I wish you were with me last week and could f- finally figure out how to fix my voice last that week. That I can't do. I, last week was awful. I, I the yeah, sneezing you had, you and, had it bad. and coughing. And I know this comes every single year. Why do I not start taking Zyrtec back in December? I don't know. <laughs> you didn't ask last week. I know. But listen, today is got to be a mile marker for us as far as podcasting goes to have this wonderful it's friend It's a of ours. significant event. Extremely significant. Yes. And I'm going to tell you, this was the first singer that I, at nine years old, fell in love with. He oh knows that. My. His wife knows that. This I is was B- gone. This is BJ. This is before Jeff. Before Jeff Duffield, yeah. I yeah. fell in love with Dwayne Nicholson. And Dwayne, it's wonderful to have you with us today. Well, thank you. <laughs> yes. Good to be with you. The one and the only. Did you know did you know when you came to our church back in 1968, it was First Assembly of God in Pensgrove, I thought I thought my world was just uh, enlightened and and oh, I hit the don't microphone. Don't hit the you microphone. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> So do it again. I'll do it one more time. So they'll know what it is. Okay. That's how excited I am to have Dwayne on here. I can tell. Don't don't touch the mic stand there. That crew cut and those great glasses, you know, and and that (laughs) Well, he's still wearing glasses. I know. He's still wearing glasses. (laughs) And he's got not much of a crew cut anymore, but uh, that's okay. No, not none of us do, for that matter. Lest anyone not know. And I don't know how I don't you know could how live in the United know. States of America and not know. But Dwayne was the tenor for low on due 58 years. Am, that, I, am I pretty accurate there? That's, per, that's pretty close. Yeah, yeah, of the Courier's Quartet, later Courier's Trio, Dave, right. Dwayne, and Neil. Right. And uh, legendary, as they say, in the world of gospel music. <laughs> Dwayne, Dwayne, do you yes. know how many people, seriously, and I'll just start from the beginning with this, I don't think you're aware, and why I wanted to do this episode with you is to remind you once again, not just of your, your talent, but your heart for Jesus, and how many people you have affected. And you need to know this publicly, that there are ministries today that are on the road as a result of your impact and your influence, and I can't thank you enough for that. Well, I think that's the way it should be. You should, I think the term should be pass it on. Mm. You know, what, what's been put in your heart, you need to pass it on to others, and there's, there's so many ways you can do that. Ministry in the, from the pulpit or singing from the pulpit. And, right. I, I, and we chose singing from the pulpit. Mm. Right. Let's go back a few years. Let's go back to the very beginning at, at uh, Central Bible College. What happened to you in that realm of ministry where you suddenly thought, you know, we could do this on the road? How did that happen? I went to school in the fall of 55, okay, and uh, joined a choir at first because it, uh, that, that was uh, the a choir had come through our church in Oklahoma. The leader of the, the choir had, had me sing for tried out and she said when you come to bible school you you join our choir so that that's how it got started and then of course the second year i was there dave colon and don baldwin who were in the, the couriers uh, asked me to sing lead with them so that's how it got started and i was wondering what god had for me because i didn't feel the call to preach i never felt that at least i can go to bible school and uh, see what god has for me and you were a preacher's kid Oh, yes, yes. And uh, we, I sang in a high school quartet. And so, On Facebook, you played a record the other day, a, a not a long playing record, but a 78. <laughs> yes. I had yes. never heard you sing lead in a quartet before until that. 
I sang lead the first the first year. We had another tenor singer. Yeah, and you could tell and it was the, you. I mean, you you were just singing lead. Oh, oh, oh were... could you could you tell? I could, oh, yeah. I, I wasn't sure. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh no, it's very distinctive yeah. even back then. We sang the old standards back in those days. How long has it been? Then I met the master. It translated so great. On yeah, that, it? that's how I got started in the, in the group, and then two of the guys were going to graduate, and Neil and I were still in, in our junior year. Finally, Don says, I'd like to go full-time. You get, would you guys be interested in going with us? So it was Don Baldwin who had the idea to take the group full-time. And so I said, hey, I said, there's the opening. There's the opening. Go. At that point, the couriers, correct me if I'm mistaken, they were like a group representing the school. Yes, they, well, there were several groups, and couriers were one of those groups. Okay. Matter of fact, an interesting sideline is that the original members of that group, Dick Malone, he still goes to our church. He's about he's almost 90 years old. Wow. He and the other guys decided on the name Couriers. Mm -hmm. That was back in the, like 53, 54, in that, in that era. So you leave, you followed Baldwin's advice, and you, you head out, as they say. Five of us headed to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We stopped on the way in Pittsburgh because that's where Dave Colon and our bass singer was from. Right. And guess what they did? They had a shower for us. Oh, my. Because there's only one guy was married. Don Baldwin was the only married man. Right. The other four were going to live together somewhere. We ended up in Harrisburg in a small apartment. You know what? They gave us pots and pans. <laughs> No food or money to put no. the, anything oh. in, but you had the pots anyway. We go to 1109 Front Street with wow. pots and pans. Oh, my. 1109 Front <laughs> A lot of good that would do on the road. Yeah. Oh my. So what did you travel in at that point? In a car. Let's see. I, I think the first car was like a, an old Oldsmobile of some sort. Not long after that, we bought the old limousine, Cadillac limousine. We bought it from a funeral director in Wampum, Pennsylvania. Wow. <laughs> That's out north of Pittsburgh. Right. We asked, what kind of shape is this thing in? He said, well, it'll keep up with any funeral procession. <laughs> <laughs> At least he was honest. And it barely did because we put more oil in it than we did gasoline. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. And you guys needed that because oh. there were five of you. But your bass singer, as you said, Dave was what? Six foot five. He commandeered the, the middle seat in the back. We took one that sets of seats down, so we could just sit there and stretch our legs out. Right. So anyway, he'd be sitting there and sound asleep, and all of a sudden his legs would start moving out, you know, sideways and, and into Neil's territory or, my, or whoever was sitting there. We'd say, Dave, you got enough room? He'd say, oh, yeah, I got enough room. He said, you ought to, you got the whole back seat. <laughs> <laughs> I was told, Dwayne, you kept a log book of some sort, some sort of a book that you kept all the details of every date that you sang. That's interesting because in preparation for this today, I could walk with you right now into my other room here and I could show you. I think I could do that? No, you know you you can't see me on Don. Yeah, you can. Yeah, go ahead. You, you can. can pick up the phone. Yeah, you can walk. Go walk yeah, and go, go ahead. Get it. We'll just keep talking while you're. Yeah, doing just it. keep talking while you're walking. Yeah, just don't trip. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you can, if you can chew gum and walk at yeah, the same yeah, time, right. you should be able to talk <laughs> at the same time. Not. Yeah. I don't know of any other person in ministry that's done this. Right. Let me just interject while he's looking for the books that okay. back in the time frame that we're talking about, 1955, 56, there's artists and groups that play in churches and sing and travel all over the United States, all, all parts of the country. But in those days in the Northeast, there was no one that sang gospel music and traveled from church to church. That's right. Singing and playing. Am I correct? You're right. These were the guys that started it. The Couriers made it possible for two young kids in South Jersey years later to think that they could do it because they had introduced gospel music to the northeastern part of the United States. And so Jeff and Sue had a, an open door because pastors and churches were then, by that time, 20 years later, accustomed to people coming and singing from outside their church and, and doing a concert or whatever. Exactly. Can I read you just a, in 1959? Please do. Take your time. Here we go. January 1, uh, Irwin, Pennsylvania, Mechanicsburg, Shrewsbury, Waynesboro, Pittsburgh, Johnstown, Pottstown, Washington, uh, D.C., um, Tower City, Wilkesburg, Cumberland, Maryland, Armington, New Jersey, Mount Ephraim, Elizabeth, New Jersey, Red Bank, New Jersey, Patterson, New Jersey, Burlington, New Jersey, Bristol, New Jersey, Bridgeton on January the 25th of 1959. My home church. Bayonne, Newark. 
Hamilton does all New Jersey, and it just goes on and on and on. Every, every page is just loaded. What would have been, now, of course, we're talking almost 60 years ago, but what would have been a typical, as we used to call it, offering for a concert like that? Oh, uh, you know, I never kept track of the, the offerings that much. I would say if we got $125, that was lucky. And interesting thing was that we went to this one church down in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and we were almost starved to death. That, and those, believe it or not, it was tough. Mm -hmm. We asked for twenty five dollars more from the church, and again, they they had a fit. It's not in the budget. <laughs> That's right. But anyway, God was good to us. Yeah. That's how we got started. Just beating the bushes, going sometimes Thursday morning ladies' prayer meetings. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> tell us, tell us real quick about the story. Uh, I've heard it, but our listeners haven't. Oh. The story with you guys were in the car. Yes. I think you were in Western Maryland, and you were dead broke. We had been down there for a week in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. The dates had not panned out that well. And as we left and started back towards Pennsylvania, Don Bowen, who was still the only married man at that time, he said, it doesn't look like we're going to make it. This is in the dark of night on those twisty old, there was no interstate 79 at that, in those days. We're twisting back and forth in these old roads and weary after a week, John, just singing. And Don made that statement, and he said, it looks like we just going to have to fold it in because we just don't have, have the money. And dead silence in the car. I was driving, and tears started coming, and I uh, almost had to pull over to the side of the road because I was, I was just, I'm devastated. What am I going to do now? I know, I know, I'm sure the other guys were thinking the same thing. And in the stillness of the night, she was flowing and, and silence in the back seats. All of a sudden, we heard the voice, I know the Lord will make a way for me. I know the Lord will make a way for me. If I live a holy life, shun the wrong and do the right. I know the Lord will make a way for me. And uh, <laughs> Nobody said a word. We went on home, and the phone began to ring. And everybody, everybody on, the, on the way home, everybody reaffirms that we're still going to try to go to, to sing the gospel. And the phone began to ring. I, the, then we said, who started that, that song? Not one of the five guys would say they started it. It was like an angel started that. that I, I, I questioned. I said, what? Are you wow. sure? Who started, who, who started singing? That's right. Not one of the five guys could, could answer me. Mm. I believe it. I wow. believe it. Yeah. You know, and I think about the fact that God opened the windows of your mind and the windows of your heart at that moment because he knew the future of the impact that the couriers would have on ministries around the world. And by you saying yes, and all of you in that car saying, okay, God, this was a divine appointment. It wasn't just about you, Dwayne. No. The thing is, it's never been just about you. That has been something that I think, <laughs> as we watch new ministries evolve, just speak into that for a minute, if you will. How can ministries today not make it about themselves? That's true. It's not about ourselves. That's one thing my guys in the group, every one of them, they were the most humble people, and they, they said, we're out here trying to do what God wants us to do. And he, he, there's a testing time came, and I, it shows up because the nucleus of the group was, stayed together till till the end. Dave, Dwayne, and Neil, and the other guys, everybody that was in the group were really big help to us. I can go down the list and tell you what they did to, to really keep us moving. But the nucleus of the group has, has stayed together all those years. There was a testing time. Wow. Mm. Well, I would say probably, and I'm going to speak for you just for a second and tell me if I'm wrong. The three most important decisions you ever made, number one, saying yes to Jesus, number two, joining the couriers, and number three, marrying the love of your life, Jean Ann. <laughs> Boy, have you said a mouthful. <laughs> Which, by the way, my husband is still in love with. We know that. I know, but, you yeah. Know. <laughs> well, you just admitted to being having a crush on Dwayne, so. Well, I never will forget the first time i ever laid eyes on on gene ann you were dating both mm -hmm. of you were dating we went to one of your concerts you just said the weekends up in harrisburg uh where you would bring in all the the name groups in gospel music and you had on a saturday morning a prayer breakfast 
as you used to call it, at the Dutch Pantry Restaurant. That's right. And I'm sitting there. I couldn't have been more than six or seven years old. I'm sitting there with, at the table with my father and mother. And there were two seats across the table. You used to have long tables. And you walked in with Jean Ann. And you pulled the chair back so Jean Ann could sit down. So I sat there looking like, that has to be the most gorgeous lady I have ever <laughs> seen in my and life. Only in my seven short, years In old. my short seven years. <laughs> what do you think I felt like when I first saw her? <laughs> well, you uh, have good from, taste. From the, from, from the platform, I, almost, I started forgetting words. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I can see where that would happen. So tell, tell us, how did that start? It started Zion Bible Institute in East Providence, Rhode Island. Right. And the guy, and the man's name was, the pastor's name was Dr. Hero. Hmm. I don't know if you ever heard of him or not, mm -mm. but he was a bombastic preacher. And some, somehow he, he had heard of the couriers and he had us come in and sing like for Memorial Day a couple times a year. We came to the school. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we go to the school. And also I had made friends with uh, a man hired by the school he did all their publicity work for him he did the radio and all all, all those kind of things he had a radio broadcast and his name was hill mm -hmm. he had two daughters and i think the mother mrs hill was trying to hook me up with one of the daughters <laughs> i know i know who of you speak so anyway make a long story short i we stepped to the platform and i looked out in the audience to the left hand side and the left hand seats and i i saw this little blonde back there and i go well, no i'm not gonna I'm, and i just like wow I'm trying to think i even said anything to her after the service gene Ann's dad was he didn't know a stranger so he walked up to us and he, we got to talking and, and i we ended up taking him out, the, the, the family out to the bus and, and giving them a tour, which we never did, anybody. Right, right. right. Took a tour of the bus, and that was it. And then we, then I never forgot her. So the next time we came, it was only like six months later, we went back to sing there again. I thought to myself, I wonder if that blonde will be there. That little blonde was featured right in the middle of that, <laughs> that doorway. <laughs> so after the service, Buddy Hill's daughters invited her and the couriers over to the house. I tell you what it was, Memorial Day. In and up as 500 was on. Oh, my. And I was downstairs watching that, and I got her mailing address. Right. I started sending her letters. That's how it got started. Wow. The inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> Our steps are ordered to the Lord if you let him. Yeah. That's right. And I didn't get married until I was almost 31 years old. Mm -hmm. okay. And I never worried about it. I was all worried about you're not going to get married, blah, blah, blah. And I just never worried. I said, God, you know the one for me, and I'm just going to wait till that happens. That year that I was dating her, I was on the road all the time. How am I going to date her? How, how am I going to see her? We had more calls from Canada, St. John, to New Brunswick, and I had Nova Scotia, and Maine, all up to that area. We had more dates mm -hmm. because what happened was on, the, on our way home, we'd finish up on a Sunday night, and we did head straight all night home. Mm -hmm. So many times I'd call her, say, look, we're, I'm coming. I'll be driving. We're coming through Boston. She's from Boston. Right. And she worked for a dentist. Even in high school, she worked for a dentist. I'd call her, and I'd meet her in the middle of the night and, and just sit and talk to her for a while. That's, that's how I dated. I dated my wife on the road. A gospel singer's lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And she left the luxury and comfort of a dental assistant job to marry a gospel singer. And she was making more money than I was. <laughs> Which is why I said Which that. is still the norm across <laughs> Nashville, I'll tell you that right now. I brought her home to an apartment okay, that we had to set up, and two weeks later I left on a two or three week trip. Wow. How many women would put up with that? Yeah, not many. Not many. How were you yeah. able to keep the integrity of your marriage and all of you, for that matter. And then at the same time, your wives basically ran the family at home. It's a miracle. Mm. We trusted each other. We prayed for each other and we watched each other. I don't know how else to say it. I really don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. It's just God kept us safe from all the, the things that can happen on the road. It, it happens to a lot of people. Right. Every night in our concerts, we talked about our wives and our families. Yeah from the pulpit, just reassuring them that anybody that was in the audience had some kind of ideas. Yeah. They knew we were family men. And, and also, not one woman got on our bus. Right.
right. unless they were con- accompanied by their husband or a father or what, whatever. No single woman ever, no married woman got on except for if she was with her husband or whatever. Right. That was a solid rule. We never broke that, that, that rule. That's right. In Christian music, there is two camps, for lack of a better word. One is an artist or a singing group or whatever that leans more towards entertainment. I'm not saying that to be critical. It's, there's nothing wrong with entertainment. Christians need it as well as anyone else. But then there's also the other side of uh, that people as musicians and singers that view what they do as a ministry. And Webster defines ministry as, as something that you have to make a sacrifice to do. It's going to cost you something to be involved in ministry. I'll just say this, and you can go on with it. Sue and I always looked up to you guys, the three of you, as approaching it as ministry. And talk about some of the sacrifices. I know it's going to sound like you're glorifying yourself, but talk about some of the things that you did. I don't think that people realize, uh, even like your missionary trips, what, what you had to go through to take those trips. Well, when we were in Bible school, we, we did not go to Bible school to become singers. Right. We went to Bible school to find some kind of a slot in ministry. That was the bottom line. And that followed through when we got on the road. We didn't want to just to be entertainment, although good, the gospel, you need to entertain the gospel. Of course, right. you have to have a good time and, and, sure. and do it and do it well. I think that was the key. Mm-hmm. The core was we wanted to use our, our talents, whatever they were, for ministry. Why should I get on the road and just sing some songs and, and walk out of the building mm. without giving a challenge? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We were challenged when we were growing up. Mm-hmm. We had to have a challenge. Mm-hmm. And to be honest with you, in the early years, we seemed to be headed that direction Okay. towards just the concert circuit. Mm-hmm. I saw somebody that leave the church. They used the church as a stepping stone mm-hmm. to other things. Mm-hmm. We never did that. We stayed with the church. We were born and raised, in, all three of us, we could have changed families. It wouldn't have made a difference. They all solid in, in the ministry. Mm-hmm. An evangelist came to us and said, you guys need to do missions work. Well, Dave Colon in Bible school had been the head of the missions when they had a different department. And Dave Colon was in that department. We'd had missionaries at our churches, Neil and I both, all the time. He said, I'll open some doors for you. So that changed our whole direction right there. It had to be more than just going to a concert somewhere and singing our 20-minute stand and blessing the people, mm-hmm. singing to the choir, and leaving. Right. It wasn't worth it enough to be away from our families. We had to have some other purpose than just to go out and sing. Right. It just wasn't enough. These podcasts shouldn't be about just one person. I, I heard you, Sue, when you talked to Evie. Evie's always passing on. I know, but you know what? You just did that when you talked about missions. You, you're talking about mm-hmm. people around the world, that it had to be bigger than the couriers. So you just did it. Yeah. You're doing it without realizing it, and that's that's the blessing of Dwayne Nicholson. And as funny and as cantankerous as you can be, like me, <laughs> you have a heart for others. See, this is the thing that is most important to me, has been with this podcast has been the relational aspect of it. The one that we had with Evie and several others. We had Phil on. We've had so many on here. We like so much the point that there are things that everybody knows about. But here's the cool part. There are not a lot of people realize the integrity and understanding of the giving of who you are as a person and how you are an encourager. And it's really okay on this particular platform to talk about yourself because this is why we do what we do. I saw what missions in my own little way as a teenager watching you, I saw what missions did to the ministry of the couriers. Right. It changed it overnight. Right. And Jean Ann and I have had conversation about how watching the numbers when you would go for a month-long missions trip and there would be no money coming in and then as soon as you'd get home that next month Jean Ann told me that there would be times that there would be double the amount of offerings and honorariums that would come in that's absolutely the truth and other groups used to come to us and they've heard that we were going overseas because we were one of the first group to do that and I had some pretty high people in gospel music say, now, we would like to do something like that. Well, what kind of money can you make? And I said, what? 
And then James Blackwood said to us one time, he said, you guys, did you understand your crew has the ability to have friends in your home area? You have the biggest following of any group that I know of where they live. Right. Blackwood Brothers were known all across the nation, but at home, no, nobody shows up for us. Yeah. He said, you guys, maybe the inspirations have more of, of, a, of a group of people in Pennsylvania. That's how we went. Mm. Yeah. They gave us the money. They caught on to what we were doing and saw the ministry in it. And so they began to give for us so we could go. When we'd go to the mission field, we bought tires for speed to light vehicles. We took PA systems and those old EV entertainer sets. <laughs> we bought those and took them with us and, and left yeah. them there. Yeah. I just talked to my friend in Poland here just a few weeks ago, and I said, this is in the 70s we were doing this. The other day, I asked you, Pastor Peter, do you still have that entertainer set? Oh, yes, we still use it all the time. Didn't you take syringes? To Poland once? I've got to tell this story. <laughs> the biggest miracle ever seen in the cruise. Our friend in Poland that we met, Peter Chesler, he wants to know if we can come back to Poland. And we said, let's do it. So I said to Peter, what can we bring? We need to bring a gift for the people of Poland. He said, we need insulin needles. So I said, okay, we'll do that. I got a phone call from Ron Hensley, mm -hmm. who sang with the Viscounts. He moved down to Elkton, Maryland. Mm -hmm. And I knew he had a truck. He calls me out of the clear blue. I had no correspondence with him whatsoever. He called. He says, I'm coming up. I just feel like that. I want to go on a mission trip with you guys. I said, well, sure. Come on up. I said, there's one thing that's holding us up. We need to take these needles. The pastor over there says, that'll really help out. But he said, what do you need? I said, I need insulin needles. His eyes got real big. He said, Dwayne, I'm hauling for Terumo. It's the biggest producer of insulin needles in the world. Oh, my. Their place is in right here in Elkton. I said, do you know the boss? He says, oh, I know the boss. I said, how many do you carry on your truck? He says, 250,000. Oh. So he goes home. He calls me three days later. He said, if I talk to the boss, he's all for it. He'll give them to you for seven cents. That's one cent cheaper than they can even make them. Wow. And so I said, 250,000. He said, yeah. We raised whatever, just figured out what it would be. I can't remember now, 30000 or something like that. Mm. Raised out all that money. And then I said, how do we get the needles to New York? He said, uh, I'll take them in my truck. That opened up doors for us in, in Poland like you would not believe. Less people think that gospel singers are just boring and dull and never have any fun. You have one story that you're legendary for. Happened to you many years ago. And we can edit this out if you don't want to tell it. <laughs> no, we never edit anything. I know, I know. But, well, I, but we can if we need to. There's one story about you in a concert in the restroom. One of our better dates was in Oakland, Maryland. It was in a high school. If you've ever been in a high school gym and gone back to the locker rooms, you know, they're, they're pretty sparse. Right. There's no place to hang coats. Nope. It's intermission time. I went in the bathroom, of course, and I didn't take my coat off because I had no place to hang it. And the place was filthy. Right. So anyway, I, I kept my coat on and sat down, and I put a piece of the toilet paper around the, the lid. <laughs> Keep yourself clean. I'm almost ready to come out. And Don Baldwin, he opens the door and says, hurry up, Dwayne. He says, we're on. Down the aisle I go, and I fell in line, and the third guy in line. I heard just kind of a little snickering or some sort. I, <laughs> I go to the platform. Well, Neil had seen it, seen what happened. He said, Dwayne, be careful. You have toilet paper on your back. And I thought it had been on my shoe or something. <laughs> Neil starts snickering. Don heard Neil say to me, he, he's got toilet paper. But he couldn't look around because he, he almost had his back to us. So <laughs> when, when Dave started taking his lead, Don backed up and he looked over at me and he says, oh, Dwayne, it's that long. And he, and he put his hands like a long piece. <laughs> well, I had toilet paper hanging out of my belt all the way to my knees and behind my coat. OK, well, so by this time, Dave still doesn't know what's going on because he's singing. Mm -hmm. And then finally he quit. And we're, and we're just we're just standing there, just just doubled over. <laughs> it's just pandemonium. Eddie Reese tried to come up and say he tried to sing the song and all crazy. Half the people can see it. Half people don't have a clue. <laughs> We're gone. Okay, we just, we can't sing. Mm -hmm. So Don finally says, folks, something that's happened that's, that's obvious, it's pretty funny. He said, well, what, what we want you to know is it was not a, a, a practical joke. It's just something that happened. If you know what happened, tell your neighbor and we'll... 
we'll close out the service. He said, guys, he said, let's sing How Long Has It Been? <laughs> <laughs> and then they lost it again, right? <laughs> oh, that was done. <laughs> just good night. Thanks for coming. It was, it was good night. Um, yeah, yeah. Just, just, just awesome. walk off the stage. You're gone. Yeah. I love it. Well, I'll tell you, we could, we'll probably have another episode with you because I'm not done with you yet. I've never <laughs> well, been. I, 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 I'm taking too much time. No, here. you're no, not. not. I'm at not. All. But we're never done with you, Dwayne Nicholson. We are <laughs> never done with you. No. That oh, is for my sure. goodness. No. <laughs> and we didn't even talk about, and let me ask you just one last question and then we'll close. But of all the songs that you have sung, thousands and thousands and thousands, what is the one song? that you have in your heart that stands out more than all the others? Oh, my goodness. That's a tough question. The love of God is greater far Mm. than tongue or pen can ever tell. That's one. And another one is, but until then, my heart will go on singing. Mm. That's awesome. Two great ones. Yeah, until then. I got an idea. If you'll start... Jeff and I will do, we'll, we'll be the Couriorettes on this side. We'll sing with you. Can oh, you boy. sing that song again? That angel sang in that car that night. I know the Lord will make a way. Sure. And we'll, we'll join you. I know the Lord will make a way for me. I know the Lord will make a way for me if I live a holy life shun the wrong and do No doubt about it, Dwayne. Thank you for being a part of this podcast. But more than that, thank you for being our friend Yes. for more than 50-some years. Yes. And uh, we just, as I think, and you have just been a blessing to us. Amen. Well, you've been a blessing to, to, to thousands and thousands of people, and your ministry is not over with yet. You've gone to Nashville, and you've made some inroads <laughs> there. And, and uh, I'm so proud of the, some of the groups that are starting to use uh, Jeff for his talents and, and you're doing your thing with, with the ladies. Uh, awesome. You, mm-hmm. you, you, you know what? You've charted your own path. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You've, you've charted the path that God has given you, not what somebody else would say. Yeah. Thank you. And well, we had good teachers you. in Harrisburg, well, Pennsylvania. Messengers sent in haste. Messengers sent exactly right. yeah. in haste. Yeah. Well, you've been listening to the Subiquitous Podcast, by far one of our favorite episodes, Jeffrey. And Mm -hmm. they can get on DuffieldMusic.com, or they can get on SueDuffield.com, or they can find Dwayne Nicholson on Facebook. (laughs) And (laughs) how about that? And they can still get the music of the Couriers on DaveDwayneNeal.com. Is that correct, Dwayne? Thank you. Yes. Yes. yes, That's it. Yes, I have. The music lives. I have 40 albums. There you go. That's awesome. And you've had to sing every one of them, as someone <laughs> yes. used to say. <laughs> I loved every one of them. That's I right. Know. And our hearts go out to Neil, especially um, mm. knowing that he's going through some difficult days. But I'm telling yes. you, he's more of, of a brother to you mm-hmm. than he oh. is just a singer. There's no doubt. My goodness. Yeah. All those years. Yeah. All, all those the years. years. Yeah. All the years. The two of us. It is yeah. family. Right. Yep. Yeah. Well, we'll see you next week. And in the meantime, if you have nothing better to do, why don't you go back into your podcast list and listen to that Evie podcast. A good one. And also re-listen and pass this on to friends around your circumference of influence, people that you know that love to listen to podcasts by far. This has been one of our favorites. So thank you, Dwayne Nicholson, and thank you to Gene Ann for putting up with him all these years. Amen. Keeping him alive. (laughs) Amen. All right. We'll see you next week.